It's Jack Jack and welcome back to my channel and welcome to another Bible study video. This is long overdue and something I have been trying to do for the past several, several months and it just has not happened until this moment. So I am super grateful to be here. I'm super happy to be sitting down with you and jumping into God's Word. I'm so, so excited and I'm starting a new Bible study series. We're going to be studying the book of Mark. So I just did an entire Bible study on the book of Matthew, which is the first gospel. I loved that so, so much. It definitely took me a long time to finish that Bible study. I think when I started, my hair was like this short. And then by the time I finished Matthew, <laughs> my hair was like down to here. <laughs> So it definitely took me a hot minute to finish that and also another hot minute to start the next Bible study, but I'm so excited that we're doing it today. Thank you, Jesus. So if you'd like to catch up on any of my Bible study videos, I'll put the playlist in the cards and in the description box for you guys so you can check that out. The book of Matthew is the only book I think I've finished from start to end. All of the rest of the Bible studies I've done is just little like random chapters here and there scattered throughout the Bible, but Matthew is the only one I've actually completed. So I'm hoping to do the exact same thing with the book of Mark and then so on and so forth. I'm going to do a whole study on all the Gospels, so I'm super, super excited. But here we are in Mark, which is the shortest of all of the Gospels. There is only 16 chapters. There's only 16 chapters in the book of Mark. So there will be 16 videos here on my channel um, to accompany one for each chapter. If anyone has any questions on the Bible that I'm using, I'm using the Jesus Bible, the NIV version. I love this one. It has a bunch of commentary, so it's so perfect for if you're just starting to read the Bible for the first time, you're new to reading the Bible. There's so much commentary in here. I'll be honest, I don't really read it all, um, only if I'm like really looking for more insight. But one of my favorite things is that before each chapter it has kind of like a summary it's like the spark notes version of that chapter in the Bible that book in the Bible this is like the spark notes version here and I love it so I do love reading that before I start a new book in the Bible it just has so much information kind of the estimated time that this was written and the purpose of it the audience the author um, all that sort of thing so before we start reading let's just jump into it with some of the back story or like some of the back information on the book of Mark. So the author of the book of Mark is Mark and you probably haven't heard his name because he wasn't a disciple of Jesus like the main 12 of Jesus's disciples but Mark worked really closely with Peter who was one of the main 12 disciples of Jesus and he took his basically Peter's account and recorded those put this all like researched and put it all together and then later on we learned that he worked really closely with Paul as well as a travel companion. So Mark was super surrounded by great men of faith, great followers of Jesus, but a lot of the eyewitness accounts that Mark documents is taken from Peter, the disciple Peter. Now the audience that Mark writes to, it is believed that he wrote this gospel for Gentiles, which is so exciting because this whole time before, before Jesus, the God of Israel, the God of Jacob, the God of Moses, he was a God that was only available to his people, the Israelites. And so when Jesus came, he offered that extension, that salvation and redemption for anyone that believes in Jesus. So that's really exciting for you and me. So this, particular writing is meant for Gentiles and specifically the Romans back in this day. So this was to enlighten them and offer this extension of salvation by believing in Jesus as the Son of God. And that's actually the main purpose of the book of Mark. Mark's purpose in writing is to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus as the Son of God. So that's a little back end information that is worth knowing while you read scripture. So Let's go ahead and jump in. We're going to go over Mark chapter 1 today, and we'll go verse by verse. If this is your first time um, joining me for Bible studies, this is kind of how it goes. I will read every single verse in here and share anything that sticks out to me, anything that I've learned along the way. I definitely, I don't know if you can see, I definitely take a lot of notes in my Bible, so I'm going to share with you what I'm taking away from it, but I would love to hear your guys' feedback, your guys' insight as well, so please leave comments along the way as we go through these verses. So. 
Here we go. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear your word and understand this scripture in Jesus name. Amen. So let's go ahead and begin Mark chapter one. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different sections um, or little parts we're going to read about. So John the Baptist prepares the way, the baptism and teaching of Jesus. Jesus announces the good news. Jesus calls his first disciples. Jesus drives out an impure spirit. Jesus heals many. Jesus prays in a solitary solitary place. And then Jesus heals a man with leprosy. So we're going to read a lot. We're going to cover a lot. This is like a lot of information kind of condensed into one chapter. So it's going to go, it, yeah, it's going to go through a lot. All right, so let's just go ahead and jump in. So Mark chapter one, verse one. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it was written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. That's referencing Malachi chapter three, verse one. And then it says, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And that's quoting Isaiah chapter 40, verse three. Now, why is it important that the writers in the New Testament quote the Old Testament? And the reason that's so important is because number one, it's showing that God's word and God's promises are true. And even if they were written way back then, they are coming to pass in we're reading in the New Testament. The second reason it's so important that the New Testament writers are quoting Old Testament is because it gives this sense of like confirmation and credibility. And a third reason it's so important is that it shows that Jesus wasn't just written about in the New Testament. Yes, Jesus in human form came in the New Testament and we're reading about his, his life on earth, but quoting Old Testament just shows that that Jesus was written and woven into every little detail, even way back then in the Old Testament. So I think that's something people tend to forget. They think Jesus is only in the New Testament, but Jesus is just so intertwined in the Old Testament as well. We just don't read about him being in human form until the New Testament, but his spirit has been there since the beginning. So I think there's a, just so many different reasons on why it's so important to quote Old Testament. But in that first one, let's kind of go back to scripture. That first one, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. And this is talking about John the Baptist. And then that second little part, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. That was John the Baptist coming from the wilderness. John the Baptist was, we're going to read it just right now in verse four, but John the Baptist was kind of looked at as this like kind of crazy weirdo, wild man. He came from the wilderness, ate lotus, dressed kind of funny compared to everybody else. So he was looked at really weird, but he was making a way for Jesus. So now we read in verse four. And so John the Bap Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance and the forgiveness of sins. So that was John the Baptist's like message. And that was, that was his purpose in his, his ministry on earth, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Why is that so important? Why is it so important to be baptized? Why is it so important to repent for the forgiveness of our sins? It's because the kingdom of God is near and John the Baptist knew that that was true. And he knew that Jesus was coming. He knew that the kingdom of God was coming. And so he is preparing people and warning people like you need to be baptized. You need to repent of your sins because the kingdom of God is coming and you don't want to wait till it's too late to do that. And this is something we should be preaching today too because we all should be getting baptized and repent of our sins because the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is coming. Jesus is returning again. Let's continue reading on verse five. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So how awesome is that? Then in verse six, it says, John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate lotus and wild honey. Again, these were like weird things back then. Uh, I mean, actually probably now that probably sounds kind of weird too, <laughs> but that was like a weird thing. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I. He's talking about Jesus here. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. 
I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. A little fun fact, John the Baptist is actually Jesus's cousin. So John the Baptist, his parents were Elizabeth and Zachariah, and Elizabeth was actually cousins with Mary, the mother of Jesus. So just a little fun tidbit there. But yes, John the Baptist is prophesying here, I will baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now this doesn't happen until Jesus dies on the cross, raises from the grave three days later, and then ascends to heaven. And that's when um, this baptism of the Holy Spirit happens. So right there in verse seven and eight, that is John the Baptist's message. That's his message that he's preaching. The next section we're reading is the baptism and testing of Jesus. So verse nine, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. I underline Nazareth because I think it's so funny going back to the book of Matthew, how people would always say, or there was like the saying, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. But here Jesus, Jesus came from Nazareth and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And this is really significant because why would Jesus need to be baptized? Jesus was the only perfect human being to ever walk this earth. And baptism really is to be cleansed of our old self and to be renewed. Why would Jesus need to do that? If Jesus, Jesus did not sin, Jesus did not need to be renewed. But Jesus here on earth walked as an example of how we all should live. So that's why it's so important. Jesus does things so that we may follow in his path. So Jesus was baptized, not that he needed to, but he was baptized, basically showing that you and I should be baptized as well. Verse 10, just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. How amazing would it have been to be in that moment to see Jesus rise from the water and the heavens open up and the spirit descending like a dove on him and you hear God's audible voice. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Like what a moment, right? Verse 12, at once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. Also like tempted also means tested. So he was being tested by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels attended him. So verse 12 and 13 is a very short condensed version of Jesus's time in the wilderness. He was fasting and this is, this is a really beautiful moment because again, Jesus really didn't need to be fasting. Jesus really didn't need to be baptized because he was already just so perfect, so mighty, so powerful already but he did these things and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness and Satan was right there tempting him like, oh, turn these rocks into bread if you are so hungry or um, bow down to me and I will give you this whole city, like that sort of thing. So it took a lot of strength and a lot of discipline from Jesus to, to avoid Satan's temptation and it doesn't get into it here in the book of Mark, but we know that every time Jesus fights back with Satan, he uses scripture and I think that's the most exciting thing to see because scripture is available to us as well. So Jesus used that to fight against the enemy. And I feel like when we can be disciplined in learning scripture and reading scripture, we are equipping ourselves to be prepared from attacks from the enemy, being tested by the enemy. We're prepared when we have scripture. This is what we can use to fight back. This is our sword of truth right here. Also, you need to pray for discernment because you know what? Satan also knows scripture as well, and he will twist it to confuse you and to deceive you. So know scripture, but also have discernment on what you're reading and what you're understanding. So that way he will never twist those words to confuse you or to conflict you or tempt you. We're moving on to the third section in this chapter already. It's called Jesus announces the good news. So what is the good news? Well, let's read what it is. Verse 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Verse 15, the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So today when we talk about the good news, a lot of times we're focusing on, yes, Jesus died on the cross for us. He rose from the grave and he ascended back to heaven. He is living and alive and he has redeemed us of our sins. And he died on that cross, a death that we deserve. He did that to redeem us and offer us salvation. But Jesus was preaching the good news. 
he didn't die yet on the cross so what really is the good news so it goes back to John's message and what Jesus said just here in verse 15 the kingdom of heaven is near the kingdom of God is near the time has come to repent and believe the good news the good news is a gift that God is restoring his people. That is why it is so important to be baptized and to repent of your sins because God, although Jesus didn't die on the cross yet, the good news he was preaching was that God, the kingdom of God was near and God was going to restore his people. And that's what people knew and that's what they were expecting. And that is why when John was baptizing people, that's why he actually had people responding and people coming to him to be baptized and to repent of their sins is because they knew that God's people were going to be restored. It was a gift offered to them to experience the goodness of God. We later learned that our salvation truly comes from Jesus dying on the cross for us, which is the best gift ever. But while Jesus was on earth preaching the good news, it was to repent and believe the goodness of God. Restoration was coming. The next section is Jesus calls his first disciples. So verse 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, as we know as Simon Peter or Peter, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. How amazing is that like, that step of faith, that obedience, to be obedient even if they were unsure, even if they were like, what is this man Jesus saying? Come follow him and you will have us fish for people. That, that saying probably didn't even make sense to them, but they just trusted and took this step in faith. And let me just say, it was a very good step of faith. So verse 19, when he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. They were also fishermen. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee on the boat, and they with the hired men and follow him. So again, we have two more brothers, two more fishermen that are, you know, leaving their fisherman job to follow Jesus, even though it might not make full sense. Jesus wasn't super detailed. We don't read about any real detailed conversation, negotiation, anything like that. Jesus just said, come follow me and I will make you fisher of men. Without second guessing, we have Simon, Andrew, James, and John following Jesus now. So this is a good like point to think on and kind of just think about for a second. Are we taking a step of faith even when we're a little unsure, even if it doesn't make total sense to us? Like if you know God has called you here, are you sitting down trying to um, try to negotiate with God? Okay, what is the plan, God? What? How is this gonna look? How are you gonna take me from here to there? What is this gonna look like? Are you just taking this walk of faith like these fishermen here. I wanna encourage you today, whatever it is you feel that God has called you to, take a step of faith, even if you are unsure. When I felt called to make Bible study videos, I was so intimidated because I am, I am no preacher, I am no like educated person to share any of this with you, but God called me to do this and I took this step of faith not realizing how many people would find it so helpful and just so encouraging to have someone to break it down in kind of kindergarten form, elementary form, to truly understanding scripture. I didn't know that that's how God would use me. I didn't know, I mean, I don't even know the words that are gonna come out of my mouth sometimes. I just sit down in front of the camera with my Bible and the Holy Spirit takes the way and gives me the words to say, and that's an example of taking a walk of faith. I don't understand how I'm able to do this sometimes, but God makes things possible. So even if it doesn't make sense, take a walk of faith today. So the next section we're gonna read says, Jesus drives out impure spirits. Verse 21, they went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. So Jesus spoke with authority. Why? Well, because Jesus was there at the beginning of time. The word of God is Jesus. The book of John starts off with, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Who's he? He was with God, Jesus. So Jesus was with God in the beginning. So Jesus, knows scripture, Jesus lived through scripture, so he can teach with the authority that he has. Verse 23, just then a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, 
What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That sentence right there is powerful because this is a demon speaking. This is a possessed man. An impure spirit is possessing him and speaking these words. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? First, he knows he's Jesus of Nazareth. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Like even demons know who Jesus is and I think that's powerful. That is so powerful because who are we just mere humans to doubt God. And we're gonna read more in the book of Mark how the disciples themselves even doubted God. So it is a completely human thing, but it's just like, how? How could we doubt God when even demons know who God is? So this verse right here is a cry, a fearful cry. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. Because demons know, they know their place when it comes to Jesus. They know their place. When we have Jesus on our side, who could come against us? No one, and demons even know that. Verse 25, be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. How wild is that? That is the power of Jesus. He said, be quiet and come out of him with authority and the impure spirit came out. They uh, obey Jesus too. Like not only do they know Jesus, but they have no choice but to obey the living God. They have no choice but to obey him. Verse 27, the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives order to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. So I could only imagine how they're like, who is this man, first of all? At first, he's coming in here teaching with authority. Second, he gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. Like this man is some kind of powerful. We don't fully understand it, but let's tell people about it. The next section we read is Jesus heals many. Verse 29, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on him. So this was her response to Jesus healing her. She began to wait on him, meaning she took care of him. She was a, a good host to him while he was there. Whatever Jesus needed, she was gonna go get to make sure that he was okay because she was just so grateful. This is how we should be responding as well. When Jesus performs a miracle in our lives and heals us from something, our response should be that of Simon's mother-in-law. We should begin to wait on the Lord. We should begin to serve the Lord in all the ways that we can. Comment below, Jesus has healed me, if you know that you have been healed by Jesus for something, whatever it may be, a sickness, an addiction, whatever it may be. If Jesus has healed you, comment below, Jesus has healed me. Verse 32, that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. So yes, more authority that Jesus has he would not even let them speak. And again, they knew who he was, but Jesus was like, no, you're not even gonna speak in my presence. So, way to go, Jesus, man. Way to go, Jesus, I love it. The next section is Jesus prays in a solitary place. Verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. This verse right here, again, I mentioned earlier, Jesus on earth was a living, walking example of how we should be today. Being baptized, healing people, teaching with authority. And now this verse, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place, a quiet, private place to pray. I don't know about you, but my favorite way to start the mornings is to wake up super early. I wake up around 4.30 to 5 and I spend time with Jesus. It's still dark outside and it is literally the best. And there's a thing that my pastor said this past Sunday where he mentioned how your discipline turns into delight. Waking up early was not always an easy thing for me, someone who has always just been a night owl. So Waking up early was just not not a convenient or easy thing for me, but that discipline absolutely turned into a delight because now it is my favorite way to start the morning and if I don't start my morning that way, 
I feel completely off. If you don't have a routine yet, if you're not dedicating and, and disciplining yourself to spend time in the Word, start now because your discipline will turn into delight. And I was so encouraged by that by my pastor this past Sunday. So I want to encourage you with it as well. So discipline turns into delight. But I love this. Jesus woke up super early while it was still dark, went to a quiet place to pray. So verse 35, I have circled and then I have two Bible verses here. I have Proverbs 8, 17. Let's read what that is because I wrote that down and I don't even remember why I wrote it down. So let me go over to Proverbs 8, 17. It says, I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. Oh, that is so good. Oh man. So again, going back to this discipline turn into delight, waking up super early while it's still dark to go to a quiet place to pray. Like, yes, that takes discipline, but this is a reminder from God when we choose to be disciplined in those moments. I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. That is so encouraging. I'm so happy I wrote that down. And then I also have Isaiah chapter 50 verse four. It says, the sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like the one being instructed. Ooh, I love that too. I'm so happy I wrote that down. Like what a good reminder. Yes, the Lord sustains the weary. He wakes me up morning by morning wakens my ear to listen like the one being instructed so many times let me just say this real quick I'm getting really excited right now but when we're praying a lot of times we're just we're just speaking but when do we take the moment to just like sit and be quiet and listen to what God has to say and it can absolutely be in those early quiet moments God can be speaking to you right then and there I love early mornings and I know everyone has their own routine their own schedule but I just want to encourage you if you can do early mornings please do because it is just it's so beautiful and it's just so amazing when you can start the day dark and early with Jesus before before the world actually it wakes up and begins verse 36 Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Verse 38, Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So I love that Jesus, Jesus didn't come for just a small select group. He wanted to go and preach to other towns because that is why he came, he said. Real quick on verse 38, I have a note in here which is just such a great reminder because it is true. Jesus was not a people pleaser. Like if everyone was calling him here, he wasn't just gonna go just because that's where people want me to and I wanna make them happy, I wanna please the people. Jesus wasn't a people pleaser and I love that so much because I have always been a people pleaser and I'm trying to step out of that terrible habit and that terrible way of thinking. Again, Jesus leads by example. Jesus was not a people pleaser. So I'm not gonna be a people pleaser. <laughs> so verse 39, so he traveled throughout Galilee preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. This was his mission. He was going around to nearby villages, preaching the word and healing people, driving out demons. So the last section we're gonna to read today is Jesus heals a man with leprosy. So verse 40, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So leprosy first is a skin disease that was super contagious and anyone that had leprosy was basically shunned like stay back you are disease filled you are contagious so they were 100% outcasts so a man with leprosy came to him begging if you are willing not if you can if you are willing this man knew that Jesus this was this was the faith of this man he knew who Jesus was he knew I know you can heal me, but if you are willing, you can make me clean. Like you can heal me if you are willing, not if you can, but if you are willing, which I think speaks a lot on his faith. Verse 41, Jesus was indignant, which means filled with compassion. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Ah, oh, I just love the healing that we see Jesus do. Verse 43, Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. 
but go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. That verse probably is, sounds a little confusing. Like why would Jesus tell this man, don't tell anyone this, but go and show yourself to the priests? Like what does that really mean? And I have some notes that I took from my Matthew chapter 8 Bible study. It says, going to the priest would not only fulfill the law, which we know Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So going to the priest would not only fulfill the law, but also help bring the leper back into society, which is, you know, super important as someone who's lived as an outcast, lived away from society, totally shunned. He's going back to the priest to um, kind of, have this fresh start, you know? But I also think Jesus telling him like, make sure you don't tell anyone this. I think we read a lot. Jesus wasn't looking for fame. He wasn't looking for attention. He didn't want these huge crowds following him because it made it hard for him to actually do his mission and to travel around like he needed to. So I think maybe this is one of those examples where he's like, don't tell anyone because I don't want to draw a lot of attention to this, um, but go to the priest so that you can be cleansed and be welcomed back into society. So verse 45, instead, this is what the man did, instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. It says right here basically why he said, don't go and tell everyone because it's gonna to draw too much attention. And look, now as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly. So he had to stay on the outskirts in lonely places, which is just so sad. And then it finishes off saying, yet the people still came to him from everywhere. They still found a way to find Jesus. So um, there's this scene from, I don't know if any of you have seen the Chosen series. It's really good, really eye-opening. But there's just this one scene where Jesus gets back from a day of healing everyone and he's just so exhausted. And I totally get this as an actor. It's, a, it's an interpretation, but it's just, it's kind of a new perspective that you don't think about. The actor playing Jesus, he comes back from healing people back to their little like camp with their tents and stuff and he is drained and he is exhausted and he just like collapsed because he's so tired. And it's just kind of eye-opening how like, how draining it could be doing these healings, helping so many people and not even having a chance to like, just have a moment of quietness, a moment of peace. People were coming at him every which way direction. So it just, it kind of seeing that scene in that series just kind of gave me this perspective of like having more compassion for the experience Jesus had while here on earth. He didn't want these big crowds following him. So he had to go and stay out in lonely places on the outside of town, yet people still found him. So I just can only imagine, especially as an introvert, how draining and exhausting that would be. Oh man, oh man. But that concludes our Bible study for today. I hope you enjoyed this so much. I know that I did. I would love to hear your input, your insight, your feedback in the comments below. What did you take away from this reading? My biggest takeaway is always just looking at how Jesus lived his life and, and how he led as an example. Not all of us were called to heal, but those who can heal, heal like how Jesus healed. Use your, your power, use your gifts to heal those that need it. We all have different gifts and we read that in different parts of the Bible. Um, we all have different gifts and if your gift is to give, give. If your gift is to teach, teach and I think that has definitely been a gift that the Holy Spirit has given me over the years is to teach the Word of God in a way that's understanding for you know regular old people like me and you. <laughs> I absolutely think it is a gift because like I mentioned I don't know how I sit in front of the camera sometimes and and do these studies. I 100% I rely on the Holy Spirit leading me so um, super grateful for that otherwise I feel like I would just be stuttering here all day long. <laughs> But I want to know in the comments, what was your biggest takeaway from today's reading? I don't know when my next Bible study will be up. This is the date I would like ideally love to have my next Bible study. But I have a full-time job right now that has been taking over a lot of my time. So really this channel and my vlog channel is really any little scraps of time that I can 
find to dedicate towards it and it's not a lot which breaks my heart but these videos mean so much to me so I hope that I'm able to make a new one for you very very soon but thank you so much for watching I'm so excited to be starting a new Bible study series with you on the book of Mark I hope you join me for the next one and again if you want to catch any of my past Bible study videos I will put a playlist in the description box for you as well as the cards so check that out if you would like some more scripture and Bible study. I hope you enjoy it and have a great rest of your day or night. I love you and I'll see you next time. Bye!